Thank you. Um, so for, for those that thought they were going to uh, see uh, Bill Delaney here, uh, this is his, his picture. Uh, he, he, has, he has not died, uh, unfortunately. And uh, he actually has, uh, took a position with uh, Mayor Deegan's administration. And uh, he told me that within 18 months, quote, he will fix Jacksonville. So <laughs> we're, we're going to hold him to that. Uh, and at, eight, at, at 19 months, we're going to get rid of him, if that's the case. <laughs> um, so uh, Bill was originally going to be here to talk about uh, some of his uh, snippets from his book, Secret Jacksonville. Uh, that is the book cover there. Uh, it's a really cool book. I actually, I, I've lived here all my life, but there were things I didn't know uh, that I found out from Bill's book. So uh, we don't have any copies for sale, but if you want to go to your local bookstore, there's actually a bookstore that just opened across the street over here on, uh, on, on uh, Park Street. Uh, he'd certainly appreciate it and he'd learn a lot. So, um, uh, as Carmen said, my name is Mike Field. This is my partner, Nudis Davis. Uh, we both come from different backgrounds. Uh, I am a, a lifelong Jackson. I uh, actually was born a few blocks from here um, at a place called Riverside Hospital. If you go buy a pack of smokes at Publix, that's about where I entered my, where, my Jacksonville journey. <laughs> um, and uh, actually, uh, I was a, what, what they call a dumpster baby. I was uh, born at Riverside Hospital. My mom left, and uh, I was taken in by an organization called Catholic Charities and entered the foster system for a long time, was adopted by my mom and, <coughs> by my mom and dad, and uh, lived all over Jacksonville. We, uh, they were a Catholic family that divorced about a year after, uh, af after they adopted me, and then they got married eight more times. We're a real good Catholic family. So. <laughs> Uh, I have lived everywhere and anywhere there is in Jacksonville, uh, but for 25 years I called Riverside my home. Uh, I moved away and always came back, like, kind of like the mafia. You know, they, once you get in, Jacksonville kind of gets you in and there. Uh, and I uh, lived all over the country, but uh, Jacksonville's my home. And, and uh, so we're really excited to talk about Secret Jacksonville. And, uh, and what, do you, what do you want to say? Oh, let's see. So, yeah, my name is uh, Ennis, and yeah, I don't look like Bill. I'm a little bit darker, but it's okay. Um, my, you know, I grew up in Central Florida, born in 1977, but uh, two years before I was born, my parents actually moved from Jacksonville to Central Florida. They were here in the 60s and the 70s, primar primarily in Northwest Jacksonville, so near Edward Waters College, Sutel, uh, Sherwood Forest, that particular area. So growing up as a kid, because my dad's first job was at the Alton Box Mill off of uh, Talleyrand at the time, um, we'd always come back to Jacksonville because all their friends from their 20s out of school were at. So I got a chance to see the north side of Jacksonville really during the late 70s, early 80s, up until I went away to college in the 90s. And then when I moved here, I actually came to town and graduated um, college, major in architecture, working down in Central Florida. Had a classmate get married in Jacksonville, showed up in 2001, and I went to every little neighborhood that they would never turn down the street to get to when I was a kid. So I got a chance to see Riverside, I got a chance to see um, Jacksonville Beach, thought the area was cool, and like six months later, I was here. So since that time, I've been here, but my background is, is, is in uh, preservation and architecture, real estate development as well and I recently launched a company on historic, combined in historic preservation and urban planning. So a lot of these stories are also near and dear with Bill and, and Mike. We've done a lot of research on a lot of just the weird, quirky things about Jacksonville's history that makes it a really special place. So we're gonna fill in for Mike today, and I mean uh, for Bill today, and uh, we're gonna share some of those sites that relate to Riverside. All right, so we actually have Bill's notes, um, <laughs> and I refer to these every now and then, but because I also worked for the, as a consultant for the Department of Transportation over the years and uh, transportation planning for over 10 years, I can always just turn this off and talk about streetcars <laughs> off the top of my head. Uh, so yes, Jacksonville once had the largest streetcar system in Florida between 1880 up to 1936. At its height, it was over 60 miles of track, and it was primarily in uh, what I tend to refer to as an urban core, but the 30 square mile 
uh, city of Jacksonville, pre-consolidated city of Jacksonville, before the merger with uh, the county in the late 60s. So if we go back to 1880, there is actually a gentleman, you may have recognized his name if you're into history, uh, Henry Plant, not Henry Flagler, they were comp competitors, but if you're familiar with Tampa, uh, Ybor City, the Tampa Bay Hotel, Henry Plant was the first railroad tycoon during Reconstruction that really bought his rail line to Jacksonville and connected Jacksonville to the north. So Plant is the reason we had a, a gilded era and a period of time that transformed Jacksonville into the largest city in Florida uh, during Reconstruction up to the, through the 1890s and up to the Great Fire of 1901. In addition to that railroad, he also built a streetcar line. The initial streetcar line was in downtown Jacksonville, essentially connected what was then the rail terminals, primarily where um, CSX is headquartered today, uh, and to La Villa and some of the older uh, areas of the city at that point. Uh, during the 1890s, however, uh, that system was extended further south on the south side of town and uh, eventually Riverside grew up to become what we call referred to as a streetcar suburb. Now Riverside's history actually dates back to, I always like to go back before the establishment of Jacksonville because I'm also a Gullah Geechee descendant. Gullah Geechee essentially being the descendants of enslaved uh, western and, and Central uh, Africans that were brought to the Low Country. This is a part of the Low Country. It's just not Charleston and Savannah. Um, but with that being said, this area at that point in time was primarily two plantations: uh, Dale's Bluff Plantation, which is presently the Dem I mean uh, Brooklyn area, and then Riverside was really uh, the Magnolia uh, Plantation for much of its time. And so, C. Allen Cotton was grown here. And so one of the legacies of that era with Gullah Geechee is the food we eat today. Um, those shrimp and grits, that stuff that was always around here before we eat them now. Uh, those cluster of crabs that cost your arm and leg today, those were things that people just picked up out of the river at that point, threw in a big one pot meal, and the next thing you know, chop up some potatoes, throw some sausage in it, and you can feed 20 people and have a communal meal. So that is like the, where Riverside uh, kind of originated. So after the Civil War, uh, Brooklyn was actually subdivided first by Miles Price, the Confederate veteran. And the southern half of Brooklyn was platted as Riverside by two gentlemen, gentlemen from um, up in the Northeast. Um, Riverside was really slow and rural in terms of growth during much of the late 19th century. And so when the streetcar line was extended to Riverside, horse dr or mule drawn at that point, that ushered in a new wave of development. And then following the Great Fire in 1901, when downtown was destroyed, and I always like to focus on downtown because people tend to say um, Jackson was destroyed by fire. No, downtown was. So we, had, we do have structures in Riverside and La Villa and Eastside and Springfield, for example, that predate that fire. But what it did do is it led to the rapid growth of early 20th century streetcar suburbs throughout the city, Riverside being one of the biggest ones. Uh, there are two primary lines uh, that led to that growth. Uh, the first one was built in 1908, uh, pretty much traveled down Oak Street for the most part, uh, all the way down to Ortega. It was built uh, by the Ortega Company and um, developed for Ortega, it led to that growth in Riverside starting to take off. And eventually that line was actually extended even as far south as NAS Jacksonville uh, during, the, during World War I, which at that point would have been, I'm checking the notes, but I believe it was like Black Point. Okay. Yeah. Carmen was alive back then, so she'll tell you. <laughs> All right. <Yeah. laughs> so the, the second line, the second line pretty much traveled um, down, uh, I believe it's Post Street, and that particular line went to Murray Hill. So the, the Jacksonville Development Company around 1913, 1914, um, 
in Jacksonville was successful, or really the city of Murray Hill at that point, was successful at attracting the Florida Military Academy to move their campus to Murray Hill on Edgewood Avenue. Uh, and that streetcar line was built to connect Murray Hill into downtown. But what we call TOD now, those developers also platted lots along the line, uh, which we now refer to as Riverside and, and actually Murray Hill too, uh, to develop along those lines. So really River, Riverside's history is connected to those two particular lines. Unfortunately, as a transit nerd, I guess I would say, in 1936, you know, we changed history a bit. Uh, we had a, a company partially funded by General Motors out of Detroit, uh, purchased our streetcar system, the Jacksonville Traction Company here, and uh, basically replace our fixed streetcar system with buses. Buses have to be replaced every 500,000 miles or so. So for GM, that was a long-term revenue generator and for Jacksonville, it's a, it's a loss that it has literally changed how we see and how we work in this city today. But with that being said, Riverside is a legacy of that streetcar system. Uh, you can still see the streetcar tracks or where streetcar tracks ran on several streets within the community. I know every now and then you drive down Oak Street, there's like a little sinkhole or something like that, or you can feel the, the ruffles in the street if you drive in the middle of the street. Those are the old rail ties that are still under there that as they rot, the pavement gives away and Public Works has to go out and uh, replace them. So um, one of the things that really makes Riverside the special place it is today is because it dates back to a period of time when the transit system and the way people got around was really more focused on the pedestrian th themselves and not the cars we drive today. And so you'll see the remnants. Uh, I think it's really interesting. If you go down, say, Herschel or Oak Street, they're, they're much wider than uh, you know, the adjoining streets. And that's, that's because that's where the, the streetcar lines actually ran down. So Oak Street is as wide as it is today. I think it's 26 feet or whatever it is. Uh, that's because the, the streetcars ran down Oak Street. Uh, Herschel, that going through Fairfax and into Ortega is as wide as it is because that's where, the, that's where the streetcar lines were. And the commercial districts you see around the, like, this, like Park and King and uh, on Stockton Street and um, Five Points, these were all built around streetcar stops. So they didn't just spring up, these commercial districts didn't just spring up because you know, they wanted it somewhere to, to go shopping, but they were all based on um, uh, streetcar stops where streetcar lines intersected is usually where you see Riverside's uh, current commercial districts. And really, if, if you take a look at Riverside specifically, uh, there's, these are a couple of examples. Uh, within the couple of blocks that are near the old streetcar lines, you'll see that the lots are much more dense. So they're generally 30 by 50 size residential lots. There's a lot of multifamily. There's a lot of uh, mixed use buildings that have both you know, retail and apartments above that. Um, so you still kind of see the remnants of how that streetcar system really uh, fueled the development of Riverside uh, in the early, early 20th century. Um, I, you probably want to take this one. Uh, you can but, start it off with the notes and I can fill in. All right, all right. <laughs> well, so Ennis and I probably have two different perspectives on this. I, I'll start <laughs> by the white guy perspective. Um, so as you see here, uh, this is not... Augustus Busting, but it's actually a model that Wayne Wood paid to dress up like Augustus Busting. And uh, Augustus was a, was a, was a, was a kind of an interesting character. He was a German immigrant uh, that came to uh, Jacksonville in the late 1800s. Um, he uh, established a, a grocery store uh, kind of near on Riverside Avenue, which was then called Commercial Avenue. Uh, if you're at the old Florida Times Union building, uh, or right across the street from that was where Augustus Busing had his uh, grocery business. It's kind of ironic nowadays that there's a fresh market and a Whole Foods kind of near where his grocery <laughs> market used to be. Um, he was a very eccentric guy, uh, was kind of known as, as a renaissance man. Uh, he was a, uh, a huge advocate for equal rights, uh, for treating uh, equal rights for both uh, blacks and women. and. Uh, he uh, probably would be a guy that we'd, 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 uh, we'd have a, as, a, as, a, as a partner with the Jackson, I think, nowadays. He was, uh, 
he, he actually owned a, a newspaper, uh, a twice monthly newspaper that, you know, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta say this because it, it was really cool uh, or it says, okay. He describes his newspaper called The Advocate of Common Sense as a high class journal devoted to literature, science, art, spiritualism, free thought, exposing religious and political errors and the evils of our present system of society. That sounds pretty cool, actually. I don't read that thing. Uh, So Busing, in his quest for uh, equal rights, um, as Ennis mentioned, that the uh, the Brooklyn area was um, kind of divided in two separate uh, kind of uh, unique residential patterns. On the river, you had all the mansions. uh, And on the uh, eastern edge, you had uh, basically a community of... uh, uh, freed slaves that became Union soldiers that occupied Jacksonville during the Civil War. Uh, they stayed af- after during Reconstruction and built a uh, built a home of community or community of homes in Brooklyn. Uh, after a while, uh, as the city grew after Reconstruction, uh, that land became more valuable, and uh, you know a lot of that community was started getting pushed out. So Busing decided he was going to do some. Uh, he was a basically uh, an affordable housing developer, if you, if you, for in today's terms. So as uh, Brooklyn became gentrified and started pushing the uh, the, uh, the Gullah Geechee residents out, he started this nice little sliver, uh, kind of near where uh, it's not Intuition anymore, Kingmaker Brewery, uh, called Silvertown, and it was a uh, um, a community that was uh, built for, I guess, an affordable black more community, or less, yeah. more, more or less, yeah. Um, by the 1930s or so, uh, it, r- the development of Riverside started to a kind of engulf um, the Silvertown area. You can kind of see, well, actually, I'm sorry, I'm, you can kind of see uh, where, it, where the little yellow area there is where it was from. Um, you can still see a lot of the, singular, the single family vernacular homes till today. Um, the, uh, the construction of I 10 really cut through the neighborhood and started really. Um, dividing the areas of, you know, North Riverside, West Louisville, and Riverside. It really kind of started to really segregate the areas even more. Um, and uh, really, uh, up until about the 1980s, uh, a lot of the original descendants of the original Silvertown area still owned a sparse amount of homes in the area. Um, now it's within the Riverside Avondale Historic District, and it's not really called Silvertown anymore because it's basically engulfed in the, in the, uh, in, the uh, in the larger district. But you can still see remnants of it today. Um, if you were to go down King Street, um, you'd see uh, basically right before you get the railroad tracks, that was more of a marshy area back then, and these were whole, these homes were built in that area. I don't know if I anything you want to add to that. Sure, I mean you got to cover it. But um, all right, so. I, I would say in terms of like real estate development in Jacksonville after the Civil War. Uh, typically, if you were Gullah Geechee or African American or even even uh, Syrian at that point in time, uh, Middle Eastern, you literally lived primarily on the outskirts of town. So many of the communities such as the East Side, it's referred as the East Side because it was east of, down, east of Jacksonville back in the 19th century. Uh, Brooklyn, as Mike mentioned, Brooklyn and La Villa were uh, both plantations at one point, uh, you had Harriet Tugman, who was actually part of the U.S. Colored Troop regiments that occupied Jacksonville, who had come into this area, who were stationed there. Uh, and a lot of those former enslaved became original settlers in that, those communities uh, after the Civil War during Reconstruction. So really, Silvertown is really an outward growth of Brooklyn. Brooklyn would have been established in 1868. And it's hard to see because the screen is so small, but you can, Brooklyn's not in there. <laughs> and if you looked on the outskirts of Riverside, you'll see another development called Campbell Hill, which really doesn't exist anymore today because Interstate 95 goes through it. It's Myrtle Avenue area. But Campbell Hill would have been an extension of Brooklyn after Brooklyn built out. Then you have West Louisville, which is now we refer to that as North Riverside. A big portion of that, really along the railroad tracks, which is the old uh, Atlantic Coastline Rail Corridor, now CSX, or the CSXA. Um, West Louisville would have been established in 1885. 
uh, by Miles uh, Price, same developer of Brooklyn. And then Silvertown is established two years later in 1887. So as the city grows, as Mike mentioned, you have development pressures that have largely replaced that particular community. Um, but there are still a couple homes such as these on the screen that kind of give you the general flavor and character of what working class uh, African-American architecture or in architecture would have been in Jacksonville back during the 19th century, in the early 20th century. Rambling man. I'm gonna, I, I'll use, <laughs> I use Bill's notes in this one. <laughs> so uh, this is the, uh, the Gray House, which is right up the street actually. Um, and uh, in March 23rd, 1969, is a, a place, has a place in American music history. Uh, that's when uh, the jam happened. Uh, what was the name? Palmer Brothers? Yeah, no, I know, I know. <laughs> I, I need to get bigger glasses here. Uh, Carmen didn't mention I'm getting older by the second here, so I gotta look, look by, all right. Um, so a couple of members of the Allman Brothers band actually rented, uh, this was a, a, at the time in the 1960s, this was a five unit uh, uh, building. It's now a single family home again. Um, but a couple of the Allman Brothers uh, members uh, stayed here. A couple more uh, were down the street. Uh, the Allman Brothers originally started as the uh, Allman Jays in Daytona Beach and then uh, were basically a cover band for like Beatles songs and, uh, and stuff like that, like kind of more 50s and 60s bop kind of music. Uh, and they uh, came up to Jacksonville to um, get more work. Uh, and uh, at the, at the, at the um, uh, at the Gray House, they started having jam sessions. Uh, and that was kind of the formation of the Allman Brothers, uh, was right here at the Gray House. Um, they went on to uh, Macon, Georgia, uh, and actually did a lot of their record recordings in Macon, Georgia. There's a large um, uh, museum of the Allman Brothers in Macon, uh, centered around their old recording studio. But the formation of the band really started here, uh, right here in Riverside. Um, and uh, there's actually a plaque on the home today, uh, outside the home, that was put up um, four or five years ago or so. Uh, but, um, you know, today, uh, the, the, the cool thing about Riverside is that, you know, you have the Allman Brothers back in the 60s, and then today even you, you, you have, the, you know, more bands from the 2000s, uh, bands like the Red, Red Jumpsuit Apparatus, uh, Limp Bizkit, uh, the Black Kids, all, uh, bands that were kind of you know, popular in my day uh, still live in the neighborhood af after uh, they were from here, went to Hollywood, went to LA, did their music recording, and now most of them live uh, still in the neighborhood today. I think it's kind of a cool thing. It's kind of the cycle of, cycle of life. And so I'll say what, what's fascinating so. to me about the Allman Brothers and is really, they were a part of an era that ushered in what we refer to as Southern rock and Riverside was really at the forefront of that music genre uh, back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and in the suburbs outside of Riverside, you know, Leonard Skinner is affiliated with this area too. Uh, but when you look at Jacksonville's history as a whole, you see Jacksonville's important contributions to music and how music evolves over time. Uh, I've had a chance to be interviewed about Southern rock in the past. And one of the things I've always said is like, music has no sound. It's all about skill set, and, and no matter who you are, is either, I mean, it can appeal to a diverse amount of people. So if you look at Jacksonville's history, if we go all the way back to you know, the 19th century, we are in the epicenter of the ragtime era here, given the railroad, uh, its connection with the port, and it's also Jacksonville's connection, cultural ties with New Orleans at that point in time. So we go from ragtime to uh, the Great Fire in 1901, which leads to a population explosion, brings thousands of more people into this area. Those cultures start to mix. And what happens in 1910 is the first documented um, live performance of the blues takes place in Jacksonville, in La Villa specifically. So, you know, not New Orleans not St. Louis, not Kansas City, not Chicago, but right here in Jacksonville. As time goes on, uh, another genre kind of grows out of that, jazz. And many of the original uh, people we refer to today as the fathers and mothers of jazz and blues, they actually were 
here at that critical moment that led to this national uh, music scene. Jazz becomes, and jazz and blues grows into elect electronic blues and these different sounds uh, during the Great Migration. And that's where cities like uh, Harlem and Chicago and uh, even you know, St. Louis, Kansas City start to come alive with that sound. And as that becomes popular, you have these young brothers, uh, Greg and Dwayne Allman. I mean, people associate them with Southern rock. I'm like, these are some of the best blues singers I ever heard. So uh, it just shows like, you know, um, how that talent just kind of transcended generations and how music has changed over time. Uh, so you go from that blues to uh, rock and roll, you know, you spin out of that, you get a mixture of blues, country rock and roll gives you Southern rock. And if you keep following that to today, you even get to the 1980s and 90s where you start to see EDM, uh, even Miami bass was something real big here in the 1980s. So uh, Jacksonville and Riverside have this very strong cultural tie of not just local history and culture, but really this global scene that we played a role in that we really don't give ourselves the credit or take the credit and, and tell people about our significant past and, and, and those cultures as well. All right, so uh, Willow Branch uh, Park and Library. So Riverside has this just rich history in terms of just um, cultural changes uh, throughout the country and especially in Jacksonville. It's almost always been this epicenter of local movement. So Willow Branch was uh, also really, um, has given Jacksonville or Riverside the term of Jacksonville's neighborhood. Uh, River, Will uh, Willow Branch Park was a big epicenter um, and really Jacksonville's LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQT, <laughs> LTQ. Um, holy ground for a number of years. So Rilla Branch Park actually dates back to 1916 uh, and was one of the large spaces, public spaces, uh, accommodate that to accommodate Riverside's growing population at that point in time. The library branch itself opened up in 1930 and it's a great example of Mediterranean style architecture such as this got some kind of Mediterranean style and some other stuff working in here too. Uh, but with that being said, this space was also the location of first Jacksonville's first Gay Pride Festival, which was held in uh, 1978, which was nine years after the Stonewall riots uh, in New York, which uh, galvanized the gay rights movement uh, back in that era. Uh, in addition, um, Willow Branch Library has its own uh, history as well. Uh, at a time of severe oppression, the library was a popular spot for our LGBTQ Jacksons um, to meet in a relative safe space within the city. Uh, it's also where uh, Jasmine, one of Jacksonville's local prominent nonprofits, also formed at the library in 1991 when a group of young adults started meeting there uh, for solidarity. And then in um, the 2000s, organizers and the city launched a renovation of Rilla Branch Park and dedicated its long uh, LGBTQ history to victims of the AIDS epidemic. Um, this is actually a painting. You can see a mural on the Willa Branch Creek culvert. And the mural um, really dates, ties back to um, events around the creation of Love Grove. And advocates actually hope to add additional public artwork uh, that would be Florida's first, uh, second AIDS uh, memorial in the space as well. You can, cut, you can cut, it's, it's kind of hard to see because it's a small picture, but you can actually see, uh, if you were to go down to the creek bed, uh, uh, you'd actually see names of uh, AIDS victims that uh, were from Jacksonville that were on the, on the mural itself. So uh, I, well, one thing I think about is interesting about uh, Willow Branch too, is that it ties back into the Allman Brothers. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, uh, as the LGBT uh, community was uh, meeting in the basement in, in uh, Willow Branch Library, uh, which eventually spawned 
decades later, the, uh, the Jasmine organization, uh, the bands that wanted to be like the Allman Brothers would have what's called B-ins in Willow Branch Park. And they were basically Saturday and Sunday concerts that uh, people would show up in their blankets. Uh, they'd have some guy with a generator that had plugged the amps in, and they'd have these uh, kind of concerts out in Willow Branch Park. So uh, it's right up the street, and uh, it's kind of a park today that um, it's got like nice sports courts, but still a very open space. But uh, back in the 60s and 70s, this was a hotbed of not only music activity, but uh, LGBT history as well. All right. <laughs> this, is, this, is my, this is my favorite one. <laughs> so uh, Riverside Park School uh, was originally a box frame wood structure that was built in 1891. Uh, the, uh, it burned down and, uh, could no, and at that point Jacksonville started to, uh, after the Great Fire of 1901, a huge population uh, moved into Jacksonville and Riverside started growing exponentially as we talked about. Uh, and uh, they needed to build more schools. And uh, this was public school number four. four. Uh, construction started in 1917. Uh, it was designed by an architect named Rut Rutledge Holmes. Uh, Rutledge Holmes uh, was one of the, was like Henry Cluth though, was one of the uh, architects that, he was from Charleston originally, but came into Jacksonville uh, to seek fame and fortune to rebuild the city after the Great Fire, uh, rebuild downtown after the Great Fire. And um, uh, uh, Rutledge had some other buildings he, he designed. Um, uh, if you were going down Bay Street in downtown, you see the, the, the Calford Chop House building. He didn't design the original structure, but he designed it in addition to that. And then the entire structure right next to that is called the Holmes Building. Uh, he designed that as well. Uh, he designed a building I own uh, downtown, this, the Central Fire Station that's next to Burrito Gallery. He designed that original uh, structure and the Seminole Club, in, uh, it, which is now Sweet Pete's, he designed that as well. Uh, so he designed uh, public school number four. Uh, it was uh, renamed uh, for Annie Lytle, who was a uh, kind of a dis disciplinarian principal at the school. Um, at its peak in the 1950s, it hosted about 400 students, all white students. Um, and um, by 1960, uh, it's closed as more schools started being constructed in Riverside. Um, and, uh, and it sat at a, at a period of, of, of disarray for a long time. Uh, after the 1960s, it was used as a, uh, as, as a warehouse for the Duval County uh, school system. Um, it was used as a, um, uh, not Head Start, it was um, an organization like Head Start for a, a while. Uh, in 1980, um, it was purchased by the Ida Stevens Foundation in order to save the building. Uh, Ida Stevens uh, renovated the Duval, uh, 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 what's the senior apartments downtown? Uh, Duval High School, the, Duval Stevens? Yeah, the old Duval High School, they renovated that uh, in downtown on um, Ocean, Ocean, Ocean Street into senior, senior, senior citizens' houses. If you're kind of near the, like where the Winn-Dixie is, the old Duval High School was like the pub, one of the four public high schools in Jacksonville. And I, the, uh, the foundation wanted to also do the same uh, for Annie Lytle, uh, but uh, unfortunately uh, I-95 and I-10 uh, started expanding uh, and eventually became uh, a, a huge nuisance uh, and um, those, renovation, uh, uh, those renovation projects uh, kind of fell by the wayside. And it's been sitting in, in its abandoned state today. But that's all the, the weird, you know, historical stuff about it. <laughs> What's best about it is it's the subject of urban, urban lore. Uh, it is called the, uh, the Devil School, as one of, the, uh, one of the, um, uh, the urban legends about it. Uh, there are many stories. Uh, one involved a cannibalistic principal uh, that would lure students into the office for, you know, uh, if they're in trouble and they would never be seen again. Um, <laughs> there was apparently also a cannibalistic janitor as well. Uh, that uh, would uh, take kids from detention and throw them in the boiler room and throw them in the boiler and, uh, and burn them. And uh, it was also uh, supposedly the site of many devil worshipings in the 60s and 70s. Um, one of the stories says that uh, uh, the janitor um, put too many students in the boiler and it actually exploded and that's why the roof is, is, is gone from it today. In reality, that was probably bums that were living in there that set it on fire. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, it's the subject of, 
if you were a kid growing up, and this is a statute of limitations, so I can not be prosecuted, but I've definitely been in the structure many times when I was, as a teenager. Um, and uh, it was kind of a rite of passage. To, if, you know, if you wanted to prove your manhood, you needed to go in the old Annie Lytle and you know, poke around for a little bit. Uh, it's interesting because uh, the, all the classrooms are on the second floor. So the first floor is the cafeteria, the auditorium, things of that nature. So when you crawl through the crawl space to get in there, uh, you see, uh, you know, all this graffiti and everything like that. It's, it's usually it was back then, that back then it was much darker because there was a roof still on it. Um, but you, you thought like, oh my God, like I'm really in hell right now, you know, as you go in there. <laughs> and if you had a, an older, an older brother like I did, that was really going to needle you on, uh, he would have uh, a little sound machine and every time you'd walk into a classroom, he'd throw, throw that on and scare the bejesus out of you. Um, it, uh, I wanted to highlight a couple of the groups here. None of those were all true, uh, so just, just put that out there. Uh, it's sat in the dilapidated state because the highway got too close to it, uh, and it, several, it suffered under several fires. Uh, there was a large fire in 2005, a large fire in 2007, and the, the, the biggest fire in 2011, which actually destroyed the entire roof structure over the auditorium, uh, and it now sits uh, in a state of... of of constant, uh, constant um, in flux. Uh, there are neighborhood, there are groups uh, that have uh, aimed to, uh, to, to, to do things with it. Uh, this is a guy named Jerome Powell, very 90s uh, art right here. He was, this is 1994, it was a Stanton graduate that actually took the bottom floors and put uh, big paintings over the bottom floors. I can remember this because that was actually one of our uh, student projects in high school was to go help him paint these things. Uh, there was another uh, group led by Paul Brimmer and uh, Tim Kinnear uh, that started a, a nonprofit that uh, goes in and still to this day actually cleans up the grounds around the um, around the uh, the structure and cleans the inside of it as best as possible. They've actually this is a a, a, a picture from this is from your 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 book. It's my book. Yeah, uh, I can't remember his name. So probably 08 oh, oh uh, or so. Yeah, I mean, 12. Oh, oh, 2012. This is a picture from yeah. 2012. Uh, that most of that was from Tim's and, and, and Paul's group. The, the walls were filthier than this, if you can imagine that. So they actually uh, got rid of most of the graffiti that you see or you don't see now. But um, just, just for reference, it's not haunted. Um, and uh, also, if you have kids, don't let them go in there. It's really bad nowadays. Uh, so I'll just add a little bit, not yeah, too yeah, much. Yeah. You've got, you got a lot of history in there. So you know, the school did close in 1960. Something else also happened in 1960. That was when the Jacksonville Expressway, which is now Interstate 95, opened and actually cut, you know, as you see right in front of the school. And uh, that was a major reason uh, for the closure in 1960. Uh, in addition, there's a lot of stories about folklore associated with the school, but most of them, as Mike has alluded to, are not true. Uh, however, there is, is, is one true tale is that Rutledge uh, oh, yeah. that Holmes, one. the original architect, uh, he actually did end up committing suicide as a result of financial failure in the Great Depression of 1929. And his suicide note actually read, do not notify anyone. I have some pains in the region of my heart. Should I die, should I, should, I would like to be wrapped in one of my camping blankets and bury under some pretty trees in the country in the unmarked grade. Take what I have in Quincy for the trouble. So the, out of all those stories of, of death associated with the school, that is the, the one real one in terms of that ties back into its history and someone affiliated uh, with this construction. I'm glad you mentioned that. I, it, one quick personal note. Uh, so I own the fire, fire station building downtown that uh, he, he designed. And uh, his property in Quincy from his note is actually uh, my best friend from high school. He owns the property next to that. So it's kind of a weird uh, kind of circle of life, I guess. So anyway, I don't want to, you know, belabor the point any yeah. longer. But, yeah. <laughs> All right, move over Philly. The camel's coming. So now we talk about food, and I like talking about food, especially when it deals with Jacksonville culture and heritage. I already talked about some Gullah Geechee meals that you see around town today that are affiliated with this area. And before I'll even jump on that, I even mentioned another one. 
mustard-based barbecue. It's not just South Carolina. They just tell that story like it's them. But originally, that meal would have been um, the Spanish who came to America, entered into the first coast, is what from y'all we all understand, right? Not South Carolina. Uh, but enter into the first coast, they introduced pork or the hog to America. They also noticed that our native uh, population here, the Timaqua, are, are smoking meats on primitive grills. And then the enslaved used to base their meats in Africa in sauces. And then the, the enslavers at that point were generally of French and German descent and like mustard-based products. So when you mix all that up together over 200 years of history, you get mustard-based barbecue that happens to be pork. That is our contribution to the barbecue world and the country today. And if you go to Texas, you get brisket. So let's talk about our sandwiches here. Uh, we have another population. Our uh, Middle Eastern population came into this area. Early immigrants came in the 1880s, 1890s. Uh, settled in uh, neighborhoods primarily just on the outskirts of downtown. So La Villa would have been one. Uh, Eastside would have been another good example of that. Brooklyn would have been an example. And typically they would have uh, started, I'm not even using his notes at this point, but yeah, yeah. typically they would have started off uh, as operators of meat markets or bodegas, what we refer to as corner stores today. And over time, as those stores, those stores were replaced or struggled in competition as the Winn-Dixies, which looks like it's going away, um, but the Winn-Dixies and the Publixes of the world kind of came online with the supermarket brand. Uh, however, some legacy still remains today. Many of those stores also had lunch counters where our working class Jacksons would get meals. So in a similar story, as you see in New Orleans with the po' boy, uh, we also have this sandwich that still today is called a camel rider or a steak in the sack. Um, but really it's pita, it's the bread, uh, we're really associated with our uh, long time Middle Eastern population here today. And that pita is typically stuffed with various things, depending on if you want meat or something like that. Uh, it's served with a side of tabula and uh, ch literally cherry limeade. And if you went to Philly, you see like Dunkin' Donuts everywhere. If you went to Seattle, you see Starbucks. And, but if you're here and you go in our older neighborhoods, you're gonna see these sandwich shops that still serve these meals today. So when most people think about, does Jacksonville have a food, a culture, or identity? Yes, it does. It's not the stuff we see at Town Center. It's the stuff that served at like goalposts. Uh, it's the stuff that served at like um, Desert Rider in downtown. Um, and that is at Camel Rider. So that is one of our unique streets that you can find all over Riverside today, as well as urban, urban, core, urban core neighborhoods. I let, might give you some more detail, but when you have guests over town and they want some real Jacksonville culture, take them to get a camel rider, take them to get a steak in the sack, and tell that little story. That's something that we should be bragging about and funneling no business to those local entrepreneurs. So I, so I grew up on uh, primarily on the north side and uh, the deep west side. Um, we moved to Riverside when I was a senior in high school, actually. And uh, so I, I was in grace with the Arab American culture because I went to school with them. And I didn't really, I didn't really, it didn't, I didn't appreciate it until I went to college. And uh, so mom and dad helped me move in and uh, they leave, you know, they didn't give me any, they gave me some money to get some, some food. So I was like, oh, I'm kind of hungry. I'm going to go out and get some food. And I went to a, a sandwich shop in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, I, went, I actually went to the University of Florida and in Florida State. I'm one of those weird people. Um, but uh, I went to a sandwich shop in, at, in, in Gainesville and it said, uh, you know, a turkey sub on special for $4.99. I'm like, oh, this is, this is right in my budget. So I go there and I say, uh, yeah, I see, I wanted the turkey sub. Can I, can I substitute for a pita and can I get, can I get tabbouleh instead of chips? And the guy looked at me like I was an idiot. Like I, like he had never, like I was from outer space. And I was like, what are you talking about? You don't have tabbouleh here? You don't have pitas? 
And the guy asked me, what is a pita? I'm like, holy crap, man. Like, <laughs> it's bread. It's like a little pocket of bread. And, uh, and it just occurred to me in that, in that particular moment, all of my classmates, the Bates, the Solomons, the Salomés, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, Anyway, that was, that, you know, all, that was all my neighbors. They just, they're all their families own these sandwich shops, and they all, they all had these camel riders and riders and, and things of that nature. I just took that completely for granted and had no idea that the outside world, it was just so foreign to the outside world. Like, I didn't, want, I didn't want to order a camel rider because you would have thought I was like really racist or something like that. <laughs> anyway. All right, so if you're like me, uh, you, uh, you, you say phrases like, down the street where the pig and save used to be. That's, that's how you give directions. <laughs> or you say, uh, you know, I, I, I tell my wife all the time, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go get some gas at the Jiffy Mart. And she's like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> well, the, the Jiffy was uh, kind of a synonymous with Jacksonville. And um, I, don't, I don't have my notes on this one, so I'm going I'm to kind of wing it here. Nick, wait. Uh, but... The, the, the Jiffy Mart uh, was a little, before there was Gate and Dailies, there was a Jiffy Mart. And um, if you lived in uh, anywhere around, uh, you, just, you, know, you, you wanted to get a, 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 an Icy or a soda or whatever like that, you had to go to the local Jiffy, which were all over town. And uh, so you had this thing called Jiffy Feet. And uh, that's like, if you were on the west side like me, you just walked to the Jiffy Mart without your, your, without your shoes on. And you did this enough, you know, after you get some candy, some donuts, that you got Jiffy Feet. And that meant you had, like, scars and dirt on your feet from going to the Jiffy Mart so much. And they called that Jiffy Feet. And uh, I just thought that was, like, a thing. I didn't know that was, like, a, a bad term. I just thought, like, oh, my guy's Jiffy Feet. You're basically calling me a redneck. I don't even know. I, um, but uh, the Jiffy, Jiffies were all over town. They, they got uh, bought out by a company called Little Champ from Huntsville, Alabama. And um, uh, Jiffies made way to Little Champs. So all, most of the Jiffies around town were converted to Little Champs. This is uh, the gentleman who I can't remember his name right now because I have my notes on me. Uh, the founder of, of uh, the Jiffy Little Champ store. Uh, he was actually a boxer. He's actually supposedly 94 years old in this picture right now. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but uh, he was a boxer all his life, and uh, that's why he just converted his store to the Little Champ. Uh, but um, uh, I think I, I like the Jiffy story a lot, specifically about Riverside Avondale, because there were, there were Jiffies in this district, uh, and uh, there was one in Avondale where the, where the, where the, um, where the uh, Berkshire Hathaway real estate office is nowadays. Uh, it used to be a Jiffy Mart. So uh, if you were around in the 80s, uh, and you wanted to get an icy, you'd probably see me walking up there with my bare feet in the Avondale with all the little fancy shops. And, and uh, anyway, I thought, I thought it was cool. Uh, a local artist uh, called Ronnie Land, who actually was from Riverside, moved to Atlanta. Uh, he uh, started a whole series on Jiffy Feets. Um, you, uh, he, when, when the Jacksonville Jaguars became a, a team in 1993, the Florida Times Union uh, had a big naming contest. Had, you go name our new NFL team. Uh, and uh, Ronnie uh, decided he was going to name our, our team the Jacksonville Jiffies. <laughs> and, and he was like dead serious about this. And he decided that he was going to do a whole logo suite and everything. And, and so what you ski was what he submitted to the uh, Times Union. And uh, uh, supposedly, I was told a story by... Uh, uh, one of the Times Union editors, a longtime editor, which I'll remain nameless to protect his identity, uh, <laughs> but he told me that uh, Paul Tagliabue, the NFL commissioner at the time, uh, started to sift through the, uh, the, the, the names. You know, the Times Union held this naming contest, and the Jacksonville Jaguars were like submitted like 400 times. It wasn't like an original name, like everybody submitted his name. And so he's going through all this stuff, and uh, somebody at the Times Union slipped under the Jacksonville Jiffy uh, logo. And he looked at it and was like, what in the hell is this? We're not going to name an NFL team the Jackal Jiffies. But apparently that was a legitimate like, thing they wanted to do. They wanted to make sure that Tagliabue considered the Jackson Jiffies as the NFL franchise name here. That may be, that may be folklore like the devil school is, but I, mean, oh, yeah. I was well, told that by, so I'm going to go with it. Yeah, well, I mean, so, you know, I grew up in, in Central Florida, but we would come up here in the 80s, and while my parents... 
would visit their godparents of uh, Sutel, northwest side of town. Their best friend stayed in Orange Park. So most of our trips were really on the north side, I mean, north and west side of town. And even as a kid, I remember seeing Jiffy's all over the place. I mean, they were here between 1965 and 1990. And I do remember seeing the mics of Jacksonville <laughs> walking into a it's store. Like cut off shorts. And my, cut off and my, shorts and or, or no shirts at all at yeah, all. Yeah. And just black feet. So I was like, oh. And so even as a kid, I heard the term Jiffy feet. So when I came back to town in, in uh, 2001, I knew it, but most people are like, Jiffy Feet, what is that? Oh, it's Jacksonville, what, what do you mean? So yeah, that's, uh, that's something that we should probably talk more about. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's true Jacksonville culture. Yeah. That's probably why you see on these stores now, you have to have shoes and shirts on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sunray. All right, so this is actually one of our most uh, storied historical movie theaters. Is actually, I think, our oldest that is still in operation in town, uh, although it hasn't always been in continuous operation. Uh, but it was constructed in um, March of 1927, is when it opened its doors. And it was originally named the Riverside Theater. So early on, we mentioned uh, how the streetcar system led to growth in Riverside. When we get to the 1920s, we have the Florida land boom. And while you see a lot of development takes place in like Miami and Central Florida, Jacksonville is where a lot of those real estate deals are being made. So we also have a lot of significant growth during that period of time. And along our street, streetcar systems, uh, especially in Riverside, you have these commercial districts, as Mike mentioned earlier, that pop up. So Five Points is one of those commercial districts because we literally had um, two separate streetcar lines kind of running through that area and kind of playing the same role as Park and King where our commercial districts kind of sprouted up between those districts. So this theater was actually the anchor of Five Points at that point in time and it was uh, also the first theater in Florida to show talkies or sound films because prior to that you know when we were considered the I guess the Hollywood of the South or the, the movie capital before there was a Hollywood. Much of that was silent film during the silent film era. So it's a Renaissance style, revival style building that was designed by architect Roy Benjamin. And Roy Benjamin would actually go down in Florida history as probably its most prominent movie theater designer throughout the state. Uh, he had a number of other theaters um, in Jacksonville as well, I believe. San Marco Theater that just closed was also designed by uh, Roy Benjamin, and as well as the Florida Theater in downtown Jacksonville. So uh, the theater's first film was, let's see, not third, first film. Yeah, oh. so it was actually the first oh, theater wow. in Florida and the third in the country that was, a, in the, that was equipped with a Vita phone to show sound films. It attracted national attention for the screening of Don Juan which was the first feature film with synchronized sound. In uh, 1949, the theater was actually renovated into pretty much what you see in the picture in the lower uh, right corner there. Um, adding that marquee that was really in place until I guess in recent years has been renovated since that point in time. Uh, but over time, you know, Things get older, technology changes, city grows, there's more theaters, we get malls, we get megaplexes. And eventually this theater starts to decline in the 1970s and it closes in the early 1980s. Well, while it was closed, it was later converted into a performance theater uh, from 1994 to, uh, well, a performance theater. And then from 1991 to 2004, it also becomes associated with um, the changes in music in Jacksonville. It becomes um, Club Five, and Club Five was known for a number of years for its, for its music shows, and I, I'm pretty sure Mike spent some, some good nights in we, Club we, Five. We call, it, we call it debauchery. Debauchery, okay, yeah. all right, all right. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll let you share some of those stories. Uh, but um, after the club closed, the theater was renovated and reopened in 2004 as a movie theater. 
Yeah, a second screen was added recently. Well, I'm getting old now, but recently would have been 2011. Uh, <laughs> and it was renamed Sunray. And um, it's just a, you know, a great space. Um, and today it not only shows uh, older movies, they also show um, the marquee movies, first rate movies that come out. And it's just a real uh, treasure to have something like that still in operation here in town because most cities and those theaters don't exist anymore. Not just in business, they also been torn down. So uh, that's a good legacy that Riverside has to share um, and possess uh, in relation to everything else in, that's in Jacksonville. One of the cities I lived in was in San Francisco and th there were smaller theaters still there when I was there in the early 2000s. And I went back about five years ago and all those theaters were gone. And it was, it was kind of a strange, uh, you know, a lot of those theaters have been converted to nightclubs, but there were still a lot of movie theaters that are around. Uh, but um, but they're, they're all gone now. Uh, the Sunray is uh, still there. Um, they have a long-term lease there, so hopefully they'll stay there for a long time. Uh, I think what's interesting about uh, this building um, is that uh, um, it, I live in San Marco now, and the San Marco Theater closed down uh, after a, a long run. It's now going to be converted to a restaurant. Uh, but the, the Sunray still operates as an independent theater. That uh, Tim and Shana Massett uh, operate the built the the, um, the not building the uh, the theater now. Uh, they have an interesting story. They actually started off uh, showing movies in River in Riverside, kind of on Delwood, at, in their backyard. They called this. They had this. It was like a I guess it's Brooklyn is where it was. Uh, but they they had this place called the Pit, and they have these after hour uh, shows there. So when you left Club 5 and you had a lot to drink, you would go to the pit and watch the Massett's shows and they would have like 1950s horror movies on. It was like a most surreal experience ever. Um, especially if you've been to Club 5 for a long time, you, this was really like, wow. <laughs> it, got, it, got, it got weird. Um, and uh, anyway, so they, uh, they, did, they did well doing this and they actually, when uh, Mike and Jack Shad uh, renovated the building in 2004, uh, Jack and his brother uh, ran the theater. They had no earthly idea what they were doing at all. Um, they didn't know how to run a theater. They just know they wanted to keep a theater there. Uh, and uh, I think they lost a lot of money doing it, but, uh, but they wanted to keep a theater there. And, uh, and finally, Tim and Shannon came along and said, uh, you know, we want to graduate out of the backyard and, and open an actual movie theater. And they've, uh, they've operated since then. And like Anna said, they actually expanded to a second uh, screen. And I think it's just a really cool thing. It's been there since the 1920s. And it's, I don't think there's, there's, not, there's not an older place in Florida that has a movie theater. It's still in operation. And uh, they're, they're now Alamo Draft House and AMC and all those guys have come in and all these old theaters are gone, but we still have one operating in Riverside. I think that's kind of cool. Uh, this is, uh, this guy right here is, uh, uh, the, the Swamp Creature, there was a, a movie, The Creature from the Blue Lagoon, or from the Black. Black Lagoon, Black Lagoon uh, <laughs> was filmed in parts of it in Jacksonville, parts of it in Green Coast Springs, parts of it out by the Panhandle. Um, my, uh, my scoutmaster growing up was John, named John Barton. Uh, John Barton's dad uh, decided he was going to make a spoof of that and called it Zat. Uh, it, is, it is the most worst movie in the world. Uh, <laughs> But he, he decided he was going to like, if you, if you drove past Wayne Wood's house recently, you'll see the big uh, safety cone bird or whatever the hell that is out there. Well, uh, so Mr. Barton took uh, safety cones and, and painted them green and made a, a Zat suit uh, in order to make a monster out of it. And uh, they made a movie and it was, I mean, God, 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 God awful. And... <laughs> But what's, what's amazing about it is that like, uh, there was a show called Mystery Science Theater 3000 that was on Comedy Central. They, they, every season they had Zat as, as one, of their, one of their movies they filmed. And it has become like a cult classic. They sell like DVDs of this awful movie all the time. And, uh, and Sunray, much to their credit, because they're at Jack's Institution, they show Zat once a year and have a big Zat festival. They have a Zat pizza named after them, which is, a bunch of crap on it, basically. It looks like, looks like the monster from the film. Uh, but that was my Scoutmaster for, for a long time. So uh, that's just interesting. I don't think we have anything else at this point. 
No, I, I think Bill, that's... Bill, Bill, Bill only gave us a bunch of notes, and we didn't really do. We yeah, didn't look at them until, until right now. So, so I guess we'll just take the rest of the time to try to answer any questions uh, that you may have. If you enjoyed this video and you want to learn more about the work of Riverside Avondale Preservation, follow us online. We're on all social media. Thank you for helping us to preserve the most architecturally diverse historic neighborhood in the United States. To support our efforts, you can become a member or consider donating at RiversideAvondale.org today. If you're ever looking for more information about what's coming up with RAP, we post all of our information on our channels and on our website. So if you're looking for information about our upcoming events, such as our annual home tour, our garden tour, holiday themed luminaria event, our preservation awards, and other fun events, make sure to check those out. Also, the Riverside Arts Market is a must visit Saturday destination for locally sourced food, art, entertainment, and more from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m.